Hello everyone, my name is David Perez, and today I'll be presenting Chapter 2 from Schiavo's Health Communication from Theory to Practice. This, uh, this chapter is titled Current Health Communication Theories and Issues. So let's begin. Communication. To understand health communication, we must first define communication. So what is communication? Well, communication can be defined as the exchange of information between individuals by means of speaking, writing, or using a common system of signs and behaviors. It includes a message, the act of communicating, rapport, and access, otherwise known as a means of communication. Through communication, we can identify key groups and target audiences to help construct a purposeful message intended for a key group such as health communication. So, what is health communication? Well, the CDC defines health communication as the study and use of communication strategies to inform and influence individual and communication decisions that enhance health. Of course, key objectives of health communication are to engage, empower, and influence individuals and communities with an aim to improve health outcomes by sharing health-related information. Now, it is best to note that health communication works best when there is a two-way message transfer and open communication on both sides. Now, defining features of health communication include being people-centered, evidence-based, multidisciplinary, strategic, it's process-oriented, it's cost-effective, it's creative and supportive strategy, it's both audience and media-specific, it includes relationship building. It's aimed at behavioral and social results. And it's inclusive of vulnerable and underserved groups. Next, we have theoretical influences. As a mix of both social and behavioral sciences, there are many theories that tie directly or indirectly into health communication. The first influence in health communication is the health belief model which was started in 1977 by Becker, Hafner, and Maimon. This model was intended to explain why people did not participate in programs that could help diagnose or prevent diseases. The health belief model includes multiple suggestions, such as perceived susceptibility, which is an individual's perception of whether he or she is at risk for contracting a specific illness or health problem. It includes perceived severity, which is the subjective feeling on whether the specific illness or health problem can be severe. For example, whether or not a person can permanently impair their physical or mental functions or is life-threatening and therefore worthy of one's attention. It includes perceived benefits, which is an individual's perceptions of the advantages of adopting recommended actions that would eventually reduce the risk for disease severity, morbidity, and mortality. It includes perceived barriers, which is an individual's perceptions of the costs of and obstacles to adopting recommended actions, which includes economic costs, as well as other kinds of lifestyle sacrifices. Now, cues to action for this are public or social events that can signal the importance of taking action. For example, a neighbor who is diagnosed with the same disease as you, or even a mass media campaign. And finally, we have self-efficacy, which is an individual's confidence in his or her ability to perform and sustain the recommended behavior with little or no help from others. In 2001, Peckman referred to the health belief model as a risk learning model because the goal is to teach new information about health risks and the behaviors that minimize those risks. Next, we have the social cognitive theory also known as the social learning theory. This theory explains behavior as a result of three reciprocal factors, behavior, personal factors, and outside events. Any change in any of these three factors is expected to determine changes in the remaining ones. One of the social cognitive theory's key premises is its emphasis on the outside environment, which becomes a source of observational learning. These outside factors include attention, which is people's awareness of the action being modeled and observed, retention, 
which is a person's ability to remember the action being modeled and observed, and reproduction, or trial, which is a person's ability to reproduce the action being modeled and observed. And the motivation behind this is a person's internal impulse and intention to perform the action. Motivation depends on a number of social, affective, and physiological influences. For example, the support of peers and family members to perform the action, and the knowledge that the action will improve physical performance, as well as the perception of self-efficacy. Now, we have a theory of reason action. This theory suggests that behavior performance is primarily determined by the strength of the person's intention to perform a specific behavior. It identifies two major factors that contribute to such intentions. One, a person's attitude towards the behavior. In general, attitudes can be defined as a positive or negative emotion or feelings of behavior towards a person, a concept, or an idea. And two, a person's subjective norms about the behavior. In the theory of reason action, subjective norms are defined as the opinion or judgment, positive or negative, that loved ones, friends, family, colleagues, professional organizations, or others may have about a potential behavior. Next, we have the social norms theory. Social norms theory is a group of held beliefs on how people should behave in social situations or group settings. Several authors have developed social norm theories. Among them, Bikiri in 2006 developed a new theory of social norms that challenges key assumptions from the field of social sciences by arguing that people conform to social norms as an automatic response to cues that they receive in a specific social situation. According to this theory, too much emphasis is placed on the rational process of decision making because decisions are often made without much deliberation. And this is a result of people's understanding of social expectations, or in the case of moral norms, as an unconditional response to emotional reactions in, uh, to a situation. The convergence theory. This theory emphasizes the importance of information sharing, mutual understanding, and mutual agreement on any collective group action that would bring social change. It's based on the perspective that individual perceptions and behavior are influenced by the perceptions and behaviors of members of the same group, such as members of professional associations, colleagues, and family members, and by people in one's personal network, such as peers, friends, or personal or professional acquaintances. This theory is characterized by three distinctive features. First, Information is shared using a participa uh, participatory process in which there is no sender or receiver, but everyone creates and shares information. Participation, or participants in this process include individuals, community groups and organizations, and different kinds of institutions, such as professional associations, churches, and schools. Second, Communication emphasizes individual perceptions and interpretations of the information being shared. It, encur um, it encourages an ongoing dialogue, and it fosters a mutual understanding and agreement on common meanings. And three, communication is horizontal and involves two or more participants. In a horizontal model of communication, all participants are equal, and they aim to reach mutual agreement that may stimulate a group action. Now we have intergroup theory and AUM theory. Intergroup theory seeks to explain intergroup behavior within the context of communication and decision-making settings and may provide useful constructs for the development of intercultural communication interventions and message design strategies. AUM, or Anxiety Uncertainty Management Theory, assumes that at least one person in an intercultural or group encounter is a stranger. This theory explains how intergroup communications effectiveness may be enhanced by the mindful management of anxiety and uncertainty levels of interaction. The anxiety uncertainty management theory also explores the roles of motivation, knowledge, skills, 
and cultural differences in effective communication, as well as people's ability to manage anxiety and uncertainty. And finally, we have the hoped for outcome, behavioral change. This is also known as the transtheoretical model. It states that behavioral change is a process that goes through different stages or steps. Each stage describes different levels of motivation or readiness to change. The model identifies five stages of change. The first is pre-contemplation. This is where individuals have no intention no intention of adopting a recommended health behavior, but they are learning about it. Two, contemplation. This is where individuals are considering adopting the recommended behavior. Three is decision. This is where people decide to adopt the recommended behavior. Four is action. This is where people try to adopt the recommended behavior for a short period of time. And finally, we have five, maintenance in which people continue to perform the recommended health behavior for a long period of time, which is considered to be at least six months or over, and ideally, they incorporate it into their routine and lifestyle. Thank you.